direction philanthropy has taken over the last 10 or 20 years, particularly the last 10 years, is not only very interesting, but it's genuinely consequential for the way the country runs. And that's for an obvious reason, and that is that over the past 20 years, I mean, roughly since 1990, there has been an explosion of wealth in the United States, and that's been an explosion not across the population in America, but it's been an explosion in the upper 1% or upper one half of 1% of the population. So we now have arguably the uh, widest differential between the richest and the poorest uh, that has ever existed in this country. The worst up to this point was in 1929, just before the Great Depression. I think the numbers are a little hard to read, but it's, a, it's about that bad now and it might be worse. And what that means is that there is an inordinate concentration of wealth in very few hands. And that, of course, leads to problems at the other end of the distribution, but just focus on the wealthy people for a moment. What they have done disproportionately is to uh, set aside a significant portion of their wealth in the philanthropic institutions we call foundations, philanthropic, private philanthropic foundations, which are a mechanism by which they can really dedicate those funds in perpetuity. It doesn't have to be in perpetuity, but very frequently it's in perpetuity for charitable causes. And given the law of charity in the United States, uh, charity is defined incredibly broadly. So it's almost anything that is on the one hand not criminal, and on the other hand benefits someone other than the donor. So there's a pretty wide range in between those two things. And it means that very wealthy individuals can set up foundations. They can designate the purpose for the foundation. Those purposes can be very, very broad. Uh, and uh, they will, in effect, then get a tax subsidy uh, for that money um, because they pay no money on it, and they pay no tax. They pay no taxes on it. Uh, so, in effect, the government is leveraging the funds that they have, and yet it's 100% up to them to designate what those funds are used for. So, what that produces is uh, a proliferation of large philanthropic foundations. Uh, in this country. If we had looked, say, about 10 years ago at the list of the 100 largest philanthropic foundations, we would have found that there were, I believe, three who had assets of one billion, that's with a B, one billion dollars or more, led, of course, by the Gates Foundation. Uh, come back to that. But uh, that was a small number uh, of foundations. Now, if we look, as I did at that list uh, two or three months ago, there were 65 foundations in the list. There were 65 foundations in the United States with assets of more than one billion, with a B, dollars. That's an incredible amount of money in that sector, and it dwarfs the amount of money that was available in the philanthropic sector at any point in our history. Uh, so. That's, I guess, fact one. Fact two is that uh, because these are new foundations, in every case, uh, well, every case but one or two, uh, there are only a few older foundations in that list anymore. Ford Foundation would be one, but there are very few. Uh, every one of these new mega foundations, as I call them, has a living donor. And that means there's an individual ordinarily a man, actually, but a man or a woman, who is the donor and the dominating figure in the board of a foundation, who in effect can designate what the funds are used for, so long, as I said before, it's not for a purpose that violates the criminal law or inures immediately to the benefit of that individual and his or her family. So that means that ultra-wealthy people are being subsidized by the government uh, to uh, make big investments in projects of one sort or another, 
Uh, and those projects very frequently, I would say more frequently than not, have an impact on public policy. What that means then, to the extent that foundations can actually influence important aspects of public policy, it's possible for an individual to buy the policy he wants or she wants. And I realize it's a big statement, but I think we're already seeing some evidence that that happens. Let me give you two examples. The first would be uh, public policy, federal policy, in K-12 education, elementary and secondary education. There, what we find is that there are a handful of these new large foundations led by the Gates Foundation, the Broad Foundation, the Walton Foundation, increasingly, I would say, by what's now a new foundation, but an old philanthropist, Mike Bloomberg, the Bloomberg philanthropist as well. I could name others, but there are half a dozen or ten foundations of this kind. Michael Dell and his foundation would be another example, uh, who have converged on a certain set of policies with respect to elementary and secondary education, and in effect have, uh, have the resources, been able to leverage their resources in such a way that those policies have actually been adopted by state boards of education, by local boards of education, and consequentially by the federal department of education. So this policy, which let me just call the mega foundation K-12 policy, is pretty much at this point the K-12 policy of the United States of America. And I think it's directly attributable to these very substantial investments in education and education policy made by this handful of mega foundations. It's quite extraordinary uh, if, you, if you think about it. I think it's really important. A second and very different example would not be domestic at all, but international. And there is primarily, although not entirely, one foundation, the Gates Foundation. Now, the Gates Foundation is not only the biggest private foundation in the world, but it's the biggest single investor in public health in the world. Uh, the Gates Foundation annually invests more in public health than the WHO, the World Health organization. And what that means, in effect, is that the uh, public health policies of the Gates Foundation increasingly are the world's public health uh, policies. If the Gates Foundation has a policy toward HIV AIDS or malaria or tuberculosis, and it has policies in all three of those areas, they become um, de facto the policies of countries, of international organizations, and they become the policies of international world health. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, one letter, nothing. Um, nobody has to take the money. Uh, nobody has to do what the Gates Foundation asked them to do. Uh, but of course, uh, this is an area in which there's never enough money. These are far from foolish policies. They're frequently wise policies good policies, but they're particular policies. And other policies are possible, and I would say the real impact comes from adopting a predetermined agenda of uh, policies without the kind of robust debate one would hope for in a governing body. Now, in the international scene, you know, it's not so clear that there is uh, a debating society of that kind. The United Nations doesn't always operate in that way. But nevertheless, it is consequential. For instance, the Gates Foundation is very given to what I would call technological approaches to public health. They deeply invested in vaccines and other technologies of that kind. Well, that's obviously very important, but there are other approaches, and there are experts in public health who wouldn't agree that those are the best investment, but that is what Gates has determined it's going to make an investment in. And we're talking about a foundation that has assets of more than 60, 60 billion with a B um, dollars. Um, and it's probably greater than that uh, for a variety of reasons. And there's never been a single foundation of anything. The next largest foundation 
as assets of about 15 or 17 billion dollars, just to give you an idea. So it's huge and makes uh, an enormous difference to the way things happen.